Welcome to the coming apocalypse. Evangelist and pastor Paul Bakley will take you on a journey into the end times prophecy. He'll examine current world events and explain how they relate to the end times. For decades, Pastor Bakley has provided people all over the world with an understanding of today's world events from a biblical perspective. Now here's your host, Pastor Paul Bakley. Welcome to the coming apocalypse. I'm Pastor Paul Begley. Are you serious? He is risen. Indeed, I can guarantee you that. The tomb is empty uh, and Christ has risen from the dead. Wow, hell tried its best to hold him, but the tomb could not contain him as the son of the living God rose from the grave. I pray that today you're having a tremendous blessed Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. May the Lord bless you and your family. I hope you uh, have already been celebrating the risen Savior. But I'd like to take a look at this and what the scripture says took place during that time because it's, it's extraordinary. When you think about it, the events that unfolded on the third day when Jesus rose from the grave. I'll be right back in just a moment. The world is experiencing an alarming series of apocalyptic events, historic weather disasters, earthquakes, droughts, wildfires, impending economic collapse, the rise of AI. In Revelation 9-11, Pastor Paul Begley and Pulitzer-nominated journalist Troy Anderson investigate if these are the true signs of the end time. Is this the final meaning of current events and prophecy referred to in the Bible? Revelation 9-11. Order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Target.com. All right, folks. All right. He's risen indeed, and he conquered sin, sickness, poverty, and spiritual death when Christ went to the cross. And you know, he just didn't go only to the cross, which is an incredible sacrifice, horrific uh, agonizing, cruel death. But he went and preached to the spirits in prison, the Bible says in the book of Peter, setting the captives free, taking captivity captive himself, and releasing those who have been held in limbo uh, since uh, the beginning of time. Now, I want to share with you, let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 27. And let's pick it up right here. Uh, in verse 33. And when they had come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. They crucified him. They parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture, did they cast lots? And sitting down, they watched him there. And they set up over his head the accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. You know, it's, 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 it's an uh, unbelievable scenario that the son of God, who still not even cursed them once, has not opened his mouth, but like a lamb led to the slaughter, uh, humbly, he was being sacrificed. And they sat with amazement, I think, many times during this process, wondering, what kind of man is this? What manner of man is this? I think even the centurion soldier said, uh, surely this must be the Son of God, for never a man spake like this man. Well, let's read on in verse 38. The Bible says, then were two thieves crucified with him. One on the right hand, the other on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Jesus, of course, knew his mission was to die and come out of the grave not to give in to a temptation that had to be unbelievable to end the suffering and to prove to them that he truly was the Lamb of God. But likewise also the chief priests were mocking him, 
with the scribes and the elders, and they said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, they said. Let him deliver him now. And if he will have him, for he said, I'm the son of God. So this, this was the biggest problem they had. They, they felt he was blaspheming. They felt he was doing wrong. Now we know they were, uh, their eyes had been blinded. This was partially done by God so that everyone in the world could be a part of this plan of salvation that was at the time only uh, uh, chosen by, the, uh, by God for the children of Israel. So God was looking for uh, a remedy for humanity, for sin, and Christ is that remedy. And the Bible said, uh, the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. But now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. Three hours of darkness, which means it was a, a solar eclipse, a very long solar eclipse over Jerusalem. And uh, so about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachadani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, they said, this man's calling for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let it be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And the Bible tells us that as Christ died, that the veil in the temple, behold, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent or broke apart. So there was a mighty earthquake at the time of the crucifixion. And we also read later that there was a mighty earthquake on the day at the moment of the resurrection. So in that three-day period, there was two major earthquakes, a solar eclipse. I mean, the, the heavens and the earth were manifesting the realization that the, the son of the creator, the son of God, had given his life on a cross for humanity and was about to break the chains of sin and death. And so I've always said this. You guys have heard me say this before. Whatever's going on in the spiritual world manifests as in the physical. And we can study earthquakes throughout the Bible, and I've done that before, that every time there's a major uh, uh, covenant or a major event, earthquakes seem to happen always. It's, it's quite incredible. There's another great earthquake coming. The earthquake of when the two witnesses in Jerusalem, when God raises them from the dead, the Bible says a mighty earthquake will hit the city and 7,000 people will be killed as they're being raptured into heaven. Unbelievable events that are going to happen. So we're watching and waiting for these things. But look what happened. Jesus died and they put his body in the tomb. And they, you know, there was a man, he was a very rich man by the name of Joseph Arimathea. He had a tomb that no one had ever used. Now, I was in Jerusalem. I've done television shows here uh, and showed you where I went into a tomb in the Kidron Valley, a tomb that was ancient. It had seven different places where you would lay seven graves. And then, of course, after a person's body decays and you get down just to the bones, they gather the bones and they put them in an ossuary where that's what they call, so he went to sleep with his fathers. In other words, they just put the bones of the ancestors all in one big box that's in the tomb. Uh, it's usually a carved out place in the tomb. That makes room for more family members to be buried in the same tomb. I went inside a tomb like that and filmed in there and began to comprehend uh, that that's typically what was going on in the days of Jesus. Unless you were very wealthy and could afford to have a tomb that no other body had ever been put in and was only for you personally. And the Bible says that Jesus made his grave among the rich. 
He died among the thieves, but was buried among the rich. And it happened because Joseph's Arimathea, he, he begged the body of Jesus. And he said, hey, look, give me his body and let me put him in this tomb. It was close to Golgotha. We read that in the scriptures. And so they took the body of Christ off the cross and they put it in the tomb of Joseph Arimathea. They rolled a stone over the tomb and even the king put his signet on it and two Roman soldiers to were to guard it to make sure nobody came to steal the body of Jesus Christ. He was in a borrowed tomb. And I think I know why it was borrowed, because he wasn't going to need it long. Uh, he was only going to stay uh, three days. And the Bible says in verse 52, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Are you serious? I mean, could you imagine? You're living in this time, this era. There's this big time crucifixion took place. The whole city is in an uproar over this man from Galilee who was healing people and curing leprosy and opening blind eyes and, and who the week before rode in on a donkey and the whole city praised him singing, Hosanna to the highest as this is our Messiah. And within a week, he's on a cross. And he's in, now he's in a tomb. And, uh, and, and the people are stunned. And an earthquake and a solar eclipse. I mean, signs are everywhere. Can you imagine how they felt on that third day when bodies of the saints of God, people they knew who were sincere followers of the Lord, were walking around in Jerusalem? I mean... They had to be, their minds had to be blown at this point. They might have said, this must be it. This, uh, what's happening? It wasn't the end of the world. It was the beginning of the covenant. It was the beginning of the grace covenant, the time of mercy and forgiveness. Jesus had taken the keys of hell and death from Lucifer and had broke open the grave and had come forth. He is alive. He is risen indeed. I think one of the greatest things you ever do if you ever go to Israel is to actually go into both places of the tombs. You can go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, uh, which many people believe is the actual tomb of Christ. Or you can go over to the Garden Tomb, which again, many, many people feel is the tomb of Christ. It's a beautiful garden there and it's not far from Golgotha and it's, uh, it has a stone that rolled in front of it. There's only three tombs in all of Jerusalem area that have a stone rolled in front of them they've ever found. So you start wondering about that. But I don't know, because why in the world did they build a church over the other tomb that, and the, and the, for, that has lasted for two millenniums? Uh, literally. Uh, it, there was something very special through wars and uprisings and the Crusades I mean, all the different groups, and still this church has stood the test of time over this holy site. So, I don't know exactly, but I know one thing, he's, he, he's not in either one of them, okay? <laughs> he is alive and well. He is the Redeemer. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what that means for you and I on this Resurrection Sunday. I'll be right back, folks, in just a moment. The world is experiencing an alarming series of apocalyptic events, historic weather disasters, earthquakes, droughts, wildfires, impending economic collapse, the rise of AI. In Revelation 9-11, Pastor Paul Begley and Pulitzer-nominated journalist Troy Anderson investigate if these are the true signs of the end times. Is this the final meeting of current events and prophecy referred to in the Bible? Revelation 9-11. Order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Target.com. All right, folks. All right. He is alive. He is risen from the grave. He's the first fruits of the resurrection, the Bible tells us. And when you think about the feast, the feast of Passover, he was the Passover lamb. The feast of unleavened bread, he was the unleavened bread. He knew no sin. His body, uh, he was the holy one. It seemed no corruption as he laid in the tomb. And he's the feast of the first fruits 
of the resurrection, he even said, as he rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. And later he'll be, and he does, becomes the feast of Pentecost. He's the Holy Ghost baptizer on the feast of Pentecost. But let's go to the tomb first. Let's go to the tomb. Here's what happened in Matthew 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, which would be a Sunday morning, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him that keepers did shake and became as dead men. These guys just fell, I mean, they, they fainted at this unbelievable uh, situation taking place, an earthquake, rolling, breaking, them, rolling the stone back, and, and uh, these angels appearing. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. But he's not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. So there's this spectacular moment of the rolling away of the stone and Jesus Christ raising from the dead. And the Bible tells us in verse 7, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. And there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. So they get the plan. Jesus is alive. He, he rose from the dead like he said he would. And you need to go tell the disciples he has risen and he's already ahead of you, headed to Galilee. Tell them to go. Tell them that he will meet them there. This is incredible. And uh, folks, this power of the resurrection was not just a story historically that Josephus even wrote about. This isn't just a, a it's not a mythical, you know, fairy tale. It's an actual event that happens every time somebody accepts Christ as their Savior. The old man, the dead man walking becomes alive in Christ Jesus. There's new hope. There's life where there's been nothing but death. Victory in the jaws of defeat. Uh, there's healing in the midst of sickness. And I'm telling you right now that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes into your life, it's the resurrection power, a quickening in your body. The Bible even says, for the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead shall quicken your mortal body. That's why sometimes I can't hardly contain myself in trying to explain this because uh, it's, 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 it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the half has never yet been told. So can you imagine the women running to go tell the disciples? Uh, are you serious? I mean, this is unbelievable. And as they went to tell the disciples, guess what? Behold, Jesus met them. <laughs> uh, when you go out running to tell people about Jesus, Jesus will be with you every step of the way. And he said to them, all hail and they came and, beheld, and held him by the feet, and they worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. So he's going back to where he originally chose them. Go back to Galilee, right where Christ first found them. He wants to go right back to the same place and tell them, there's a new covenant that has just been born. There's a new hope for mankind. And so uh, that hope is in us today. You know, the whole world has to stop on Resurrection Sunday. The whole world knows what today is. There's no denying. There's no other uh, God or deity ever created by humanity that can even compare to the gospel story of Jesus Christ. His truth is real. His legacy lives on. His anointing 
is fresh every day. And uh, it brings great hope and strength to every one of us uh, that there's a better place to go. Look, I'm not, when we die, this is not the end of it. When, when, when we leave this world, that is not the end of it. But folks, it's just a crossing over. It's just a place where we are translated. We're transferred from out of this body of human clay and bone and, and turned into this glorified body likened to Christ. It is a glorious transformation in Jesus Christ. And so, um, wow. And, and, and I just think that sometimes we should just stop and, and, and recognize what Christ has done in each of us. He's done it in each of us. I'd like to go toward the end of the chapter, though, because Jesus does meet them. And uh, in verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I mean, it's a hard deal to, to believe, <laughs> for some of these guys to believe that could this really be the man we saw crucified on that cross? Is this Jesus of Nazareth? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is a powerful conclusion of the resurrection of Christ. Now, he stays on the earth another 40 days, uh, ministering to the disciples, uh, meeting at least 500 others, uh, being seen, and, and, uh, and the witnesses were everywhere. So Christ certainly rose from the dead. It's been recorded. It's been documented it's, it is established. But the good news is he's going to come back. Now, here's the thing. It was hard for people to believe that this was the Son of God because he was the son of a carpenter. Grew up in Nazareth. You know, how can we believe that this truly, truly, truly the Messiah? I got news for you. In the midst of the madness, we've got a Messiah today. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of all of this, we've got a, we've got a Savior. He's alive indeed. And not just because the story says He is. He's alive in me and you. He's alive in your life. And uh, you, you might as well just start walking in that kingdom blessing, that royal kingdom, that kingdom of peace, that kingdom of great hope and power. Because inside of you, the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you're a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror through Christ that strengthens you. You've got the everlasting uh, power of God uh, living inside you. And you are led by the anointing of God. You know what? I have faith uh, that this same power, the same grace, the same mercy that God has showed each and every one of us, is not only just for us, but it's for our children and our children's children, even those that are afar off, many generations. This is the perfect plan. If we accept it and walk in it and live in that blessing. And you know what? I, I, I can't explain it any better. If you taste, Jesus said, come, taste of me and see if I'm not good. Come. Come unto the water of life. Come unto me, that ye that hunger and thirst after righteousness, and ye shall be filled. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ while he is near. I'll be right back in just a moment. 
The world is experiencing an alarming series of apocalyptic events, historic weather disasters, earthquakes, droughts, wildfires, impending economic collapse, the rise of AI. In Revelation 9-11, Pastor Paul Begley and Pulitzer-nominated journalist Troy Anderson investigate if these are the true signs of the end times. Is this the final meeting of current events and prophecy referred to in the Bible? Revelation 9-11. Order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Target.com. You know, it's just amazing what Christ has done in our lives. I know you're celebrating this Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and with family and friends, and with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You and I know something that the world doesn't know, that the greatest peace that passes all understanding is in our lives. But I want to encourage us, all of us, to be that, that light, to be that city set on a hill, to encourage others to find out about the power of the risen Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. Encourage them to come to the shows on Sundays, when our, whatever time this airs in your neighborhood. Let them know that there's a, there's a gospel message of peace and hope. They need to understand the time we're in and encourage them to be a part of this. And maybe there's folks you know that are Christians that are just kind of, you know, passing the time. We need to get them in this army. We need to get them in the, uh, in the game, really, to get them out there and get them enthused about being a light and being a witness to others who don't know him. This is the end times. This is the harvest time. Come to my website at paulbegleyprophecy.com. I'd love for you to do that. We've got all kinds of material for you. I've got CDs and things you can get, books, and, and also a prayer wall where you can leave prayer requests there. And find out how we've connected. Right now, we have over 33,000 members of our online church. It's an incredible group of people that God has pulled together. They're from all over the world. Matter of fact, the last webinar we just did, we, we were just talking about it, how that it was uh, seen in 43 nations and in 44 states of, the, of this country. We're getting that gospel message out. It's a message of hope and peace. And I want you to be a part of that. Can I bless you right now in Jesus' name? Father, just bless the folks there. Bless their homes. Bless their families. Bless their careers. God, bless everything they do according to your will. Help us, Lord, to be that light, that burning light, to tell about the great news of Jesus Christ, how he died and rose again. God, give us the boldness and the kindness and the, and the ability to shine that light to others. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I tell you what, I've enjoyed being here today. It's always great to be with you as we worship together, and uh, we love you. Now, I also have a YouTube channel. You can find out about all the YouTube videos we do, so check it out. Just look for Paul Begley on YouTube. You'll find me, and share it with others because Jesus is coming soon.